glad to be here this morning. We are so grateful and thankful to be able to stand here this morning to worship you, to praise you, Father God. I thank you for your love, for your mercy, for your grace. I pray that this morning that you would just meet us here, that we would feel your spirit, that we would feel your love, that we would feel the hope in you this morning, that we would just sing with our whole hearts, Father, true, authentic worship to you because you are a God worthy of praise, honor, and glory. I pray for all those who are sick, who are home, who couldn't make it today, who are on their way, Father. Be with them, bless them, protect them, keep them. And I pray that we would continue as one body to just move closer and draw us near into your presence, into your glory, Father God. Pray for pastor, whoever's going to bring the message this morning, Father, that you would bless them and touch them and keep them, Father God, that they would speak holy words from you this morning and that we would hear your words and put them into action, Father God. We just want to be more and more like Jesus this morning. And we want to push that out into our lives, into our community, Father God, that we're here to celebrate you this morning. So I pray that as you continue to move in our lives, that we would collectively come together, Father God, to please you and to bring you glory. In Jesus' most holy and precious name, we pray all things. Amen. 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 Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Meridian Baptist Church. Feel free to have a seat for a moment. My name is Anthony, and it's great to see each and every one of you here today. And it's really great to be back in the house of the Lord this morning. I want to say thank you for praying for me as I've been out for a couple weeks, um, recovering from you know being sick and stuff like that. And there's other people who are kind of, I don't know, something's in the air, something's going around. So if you don't see someone you normally see, pray for them because they're probably at home sick. Um, and uh, just keep them in your thoughts this week as you go along. So um, in your bulletins, you'll find a connection card. I encourage you to fill one out for us and drop it off in our offering today. It's a little uh, third sheet of paper like this. On the back is an opportunity for you to tell us how we can pray for you, how we can pray for your community, and the things that you are asking God to do in your life. And I encourage you to fill that out as well and make sure that that gets dropped off. Um, and I honestly, every time I'm up here, I say that that's the most important part because it really is the most important part is that we pray for each other. Um, everything else comes, you know, I, want, I don't want to say secondary, but you know, there's a hierarchy, right? Jesus and then others and then ourselves, right? We learned that in Sunday school, the acronym of joy. Uh, but I'm not up here to preach. I'm here to welcome you guys. <laughs> Not, not, apparently not yet. <laughs> um, we're going to go ahead and read our weekly scripture challenge verse together. So if you'll read along with me, please. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 7. Amen. You know, meditate on that verse this week. Keep it close to your heart and think about it as you interact with others and as you go and do the work of the Lord. Um, you know, and, and you'll be blessed. You really will. Uh, we're going to go ahead and continue with our worship together this morning. Um, before we start singing the next song, why don't we go ahead and stand and say hello to one another. And, um, you know, if somebody is a little standoffish, it might just be because they have a scratchy throat. So don't be offended by it. Like I said before, something's going around. But be blessed this morning, and it's great to see you. Good morning, Meridian. Good morning. I see everybody here this morning. We're going to start out uh, with our weekly prayer text, and uh, we're going to be reading from John 15, 5. <clears throat> I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear fruit, much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15, 5. In our weekly prayer emphasis, <clears throat> those of you who are not connected to Jesus as the true vine will do nothing and bear no fruit. Pray for those lost who don't know Jesus to recognize their need to be connected to the source of all life. And you know, that right there is, is an important part because there are some people in life who say they're Christians, um, they Christians on Sundays, and then they do crazy stuff during the week, 
Okay? And then there's the Christians who do Christian stuff all through the week. They're believing in Jesus and doing what they're supposed to do. But, you know, with, without Jesus, there really is no help for us. Okay? Our faith and our trust has to lie in Jesus. It's not just a bumper sticker you see on some guy's truck, okay, or on a sign, even in, in, in uh, Sunday school, as we have in our, in our room, where it says, um, Jesus is the only way, okay? Jesus is the only way. And if we don't follow that and do what we're supposed to, we're going to be left in the dark. Uh, let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us all here today. We pray for those who cannot be with us today. We pray for those who are traveling. Give them safety. Put a hedge of protection around them while they're traveling. We pray for those who are ill. We pray for our pastor Slade, who has been um, coming around with his COVID that he had. And um, he is getting along better now and being able to uh, do other things that he's supposed to do within the church. We pray for all those who are ailing, people who are sick, and people who are healing, people who need the strength in the Lord to continue them <clears throat> to do their daily activities. We want to pray for Pastor Parker, who's going to be coming up here, to give the message today that, Lord, you instill in him your words and your, the Holy Spirit in him to bring through his mind, through his voice, and through, the, through his tongue to us to... Um, be able for us to go on today and the rest of the week to honor you, Jesus, throughout the day and through our lives. We ask this all in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Jay. Appreciate you. I also want to thank the AV team in the back there that rarely gets thanked, and especially our up and coming, soon to be on world tour praise team. Amen. Amen. I don't know if y'all were listening to that harmonies that were going on up here in the front, man. It was beautiful to hear. And then the, the little younger praise team cats, they, they, they holding it down, you know? So that's a good juice. Praise God for it all. Let's just open up in a quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for who you are, my Father, my God, my Savior. And we as a body of believers thank you for what you've done for us, that work of the cross. Just praise your name for it, Father, and just ask, Lord, that your word would go forward this morning as you meant for it to go. <clears throat> I am just a conduit, for in my strength is corruption, but with you I am incorrupt. And I pray, Father, for your strength to preach this sermon, and I pray for you to Fertilize the hearts of your people that will hear this today and maybe sometime later in the future, but fertilize their hearts that it, it would land on quality soil. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, before getting up here, you know, you know me, I just told the praise team I'd rather just sit down in the pew and Maybe somebody else would get up. I don't know. <laughs> It'd be all good for me. Um, but um, I have a call on my life, and, and therefore, here I am. Uh, the title of today's sermon is It Starts With Faith. I want to say I don't care what you're going through. I don't care how life is presenting itself to you. I don't care if you've got a million bucks in, in your or portfolio or if you've got $2 in your pocket. It all starts with faith. I remember having a meeting over at Pastor Slade's house with a group of folks. And we were talking about the Cool World Teen Center, re reigniting it, if you will. And um, I had told them, I said, you know, I was sitting in my backyard and, and these words came to me 
I do a lot of thinking in my backyard while I watch Andy Griffith and the Gunsmoke and good quality shows like that, you know? Um, but it came, it stands, I mean, it starts with faith. It starts with faith. All that we were trying to get going on and doing, you know, we can, we can postulate in our minds and we can make all kinds of plans. And what does the Lord do with our plans that we make? He might laugh at them. But his plan, yeah, whatever you want, but his plan is the one that we are trying to, to, to live for and to see uh, in the fruition thereof. So I told him, I said, you know, it starts with faith. Cool world, starts with faith. So my scripture is out of Matthew 17. I will be reading from 14 through 20. As you're turning pages, and I'm not hearing, so you might be using your phone, uh, to find that scripture, just be mindful, prior to this scripture that I'll read, Jesus was up on the mountain and his transfiguration was taking place. Peter, James, and John were up there with him. The other nine disciples, that is, were outside of that experience and did not see the transfiguration where Christ was speaking with Moses and Elijah. Um, so with that, that kind of lets you know, we're talking about initially the other nine, okay? Beginning at verse 14, the word of the Lord reads, when they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Christ is responding here in verse 17. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, because you have so little faith. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. I want to remind you of a key truth here, or at least what I call key truths. That succumbs, that succumbs, but that will be a part of the entire sermon. You can keep this like floating around in your head, if you will. You have to have faith to believe God can. But then you have to have faith to believe God will. There's a faith that he can because what? I said this earlier in an earlier service. God can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that worketh within us. So we know he can. Our focus needs to be that God will. That God will. Remember, it takes faith to establish relationships. You don't come out knowing who you're going to marry. You had to see her, you know. Back in the day, we did a little peek from the, the other side of the you know, area. We would peep them out. You know, we don't do that much anymore. But you have to establish that relationship. It doesn't come without your transparency, your being vulnerable, your opening up to where you can find a spouse or a, a, a wife or a husband or a boyfriend, girlfriend, where, wherever you're at in life. It takes you to put forth that investment to engage yourself to establish relationship. And you have to have enough faith to believe that this is worthwhile. It takes faith to truly forgive. Now, we can say we forgive, but I won't forget. And that's more than likely true. The problem, though, there is, have you truly forgiven? 
If you're holding on to something that these persons or people or organization or even an ex-church has done to you, then you haven't forgiven them. As a result of unforgiveness, now you become bound and you can explode and express yourself in a way that the Lord may need for you to do. It takes faith to accomplish in God what is extraordinary through human endeavors. Some of the things that we do and we take for granted that we're able to do that we consider, oh, well, I went to school, I learned that, or I know that, or I have this talent or that talent. Um, it takes faith to accomplish the extraordinary things that God can have you do. Extraordinary things, like listening to his word and then being able to say something of encouragement to somebody else. That's extraordinary. That's not something that happens every single day. To have a coworker and you know that they're hurting with something and, and whatever, but whatever they need is they just need somebody to listen or somebody to walk with them or somebody to pray with them. I remember I was going through a very serious situation and I had a coworker, uh, she's been here to the, the services a couple of times, um, back when I was married with L'Oreal. But she uh, would come to my office and she would say, you know, the Holy Spirit has you on my heart. Can we pray or can I pray for you? And I was like, sure, sure you can pray. And what it would do is it would help me stay encouraged because I was in a, in a, a racist environment, honestly, and I was one of the top executives in this racist environment and it was hard to get through. And to have those prayers and to know that those prayers were coming was, was very instrumental. So I consider that extraordinary for the Lord. It takes faith to live a life of love and to show mercy and forgiveness. It takes faith to live that. Now we're talking about, a, you know, people talk about joy and being happy. You know joy ain't got nothing to do with being happy, right? Joy is the state of being and where you are and how you reside with the Lord, knowing that your spirit and your soul is free. Now that's joy. Happy is like a momentary thing. All right, that just came out. I don't know where that's from. <laughs> but hey, it is what it is. But Christ has already, had already given these disciples, these nine that had laid back, actually he gave to all 12, the ability to cast out demons. And he, he says that in Mark and in Luke. We could read that. But in verse 17, he says, you unbelieving and perverse generation. Now, I question, well, Lord, why would you say perverse? So I looked it up. And perversion is a deviation from righteousness and a turning away from the true intent or purpose. So this is an unbelieving and perverse generation. Then you have to ask yourself, well, how have we deviated from righteousness? How have we as a body of believers become somewhat unbelieving and perverse? How come we can't tell a mountain to move and it actually moves? Why do we walk up to, to a, a, a situation in our lives and we say, you know, in the name of Jesus, whatever, stop, and it keeps going. We'll learn more about that, hopefully, a little bit later in the sermon. But how have we deviated from righteousness or walk with Christ? Is he still first in our lives? Are we really developing into being disciples of Jesus Christ? Now, we explain things contrary to God's word sometimes. And we try to find approval in it. Now, you might be saying, well, Pastor Gary, what are you really saying? There are things that we accept in our lives that we do or that we accept. And we have used maybe a little controversion of, of God's word in order to believe what we accept. Now, this morning, I used um, sexual orientation. God's word says it's an abomination but we accept I don't want to say the word but I guess I should we accept homosexuality and lesbian behaviors 
we accept LGBTQ plus or whatever, you know? We accept those things. But God said it's an abomination, you know? Somewhat controversial because other people might say, well, God loves them just like he loves me. And you're absolutely right. He does. God loves all. He died for everybody. But in his word, you know, fornication is, is, is just as unacceptable as homosexuality. It's all the same. So we have to be careful how we try to denounce uh, same-sex relations and uh, heterosexual activity. We accept that more than we do same-sex. So I'm not saying, let me back up, because I don't want to confuse you. It's all wrong, okay? Homosexual intercourse and heterosexual premarital intercourse is wrong. But we use words of expression that help us to, 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 to accept it. We explain these things to accept it. That's a perversion that we have. All right. Ain't no amens. I, I got you. I'll be cool. Sometimes we just go through and we just seem to be checking the box in our spiritual growth. The fact that we went to church today, we could, ch -ch -ch, I'm good there. I got fire insurance. If something happened to me on the way home, I know I won't be dying and going to hell. Why? Because I went to church. I love Jesus. But yet we stay in our comfort zone. I had the pleasure of visiting another place a little last week, which is why I was not here. And at this particular place that I was visiting, I would go out and, and sit, and you could watch these little, is anybody, sand crabs. They dig little holes, and they come out, and then they run around, seeing what little food they could scavenge. Then they run back in the hole. Then the bigger crab comes by and sees them, tries to dig up their hole because he's going to eat them up. But in all of those kinds of things, but it's like they're in their comfort zone. That's how we do. We come to church, that's still our comfort zone. We go home, we're in our comfort zone. Those of us who work, you go to work, you're in your comfort zone. The question is, when do you come out of your comfort zone to be enough, to have enough boldness and daring to, to, to share Christ? I'm not saying you got to be a street preacher. Or you got to go knock on doors. But there should be something about your life or you in the neighborhood where people know you are a child of God. You got a little something on this. You got a joy that's not happiness. But you got a joy knowing where your soul is going to rest. When problems come your way, you're not sitting there all, oh, woe is me. You know, I can't. You know, what is this? We have more, more, what is it? More month than money, a lot of times. That's the nature of the beast. In fact, that even happened last month, you know, and it might happen the month prior to that. But we need to be focused on living a life of joy that lets everybody know that we are indeed children of God. We're not caught up in this comfort zone where we just, you know, we go from one place to another, checking the boxes of our spirituality. But all of this starts with faith. I don't care what you're trying to accomplish, where you're trying to go, it all starts with faith. We have to ask ourselves, are we being complacent Christians? And what I mean by that is have we begun to decrease the effort that's needed to maintain a healthy and, and positive relationship with the Lord? I remember this morning used to be, excuse me, let me back up. Used to be in my life, I would get up and before I would do anything, I got to go have me get my scripture, I get the book out, or I got a, a, a Bible app or something where I, you know, I'm reading God's word, studying on God's word, maybe even responding to my little group and what have you, and then praying every day. But then something happened. Started having appointments. I had to go be here by 
8.30 and you got to deal with traffic in San Diego. So that means for me to be somewhere at 8.30, I had to leave, you know, 7, 7.15, which means that what did it do? It cut into my prayer and devotion time. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm sure you've gotten a little busy. And in your busyness, things have started to happen where you have allowed that busyness to cut into your prayer time, to cut into your devotion time, to cut into your God time. And we're all guilty. I don't care who you are. You know, you could be a preacher with seminary degrees, or you could be a cat that's just hanging loose in life. We all are guilty. And we all need to repent and just move forward. It starts with faith. We have to ask ourselves, do we care for him or do we want him to be proud of us? I often preach, not preach, but pray, and I say, I want the Lord to look upon us with a big Kool-Aid smile. Now, that might make me old school, but the old school folks who used to drink Kool-Aid know what a Kool-Aid smile is. It's a big ear-to-ear, happy, happy grin about what I see or what's coming my way. I want the Lord to have that Kool-Aid smile for me. I want him to have that Kool-Aid smile for, for my group of, of believers, my body of believers. So you have to ask, am I giving my best? Or am I just being complacent, which takes the Lord for granted? In fact, what we have a tendency to do in our explanation of our contrariness to God's word God now becomes a genie in a bottle. And we call him out. When things get rough, we need a few wishes to come put us in the right space, in the right frame of mind. Or we want him to come and punish people that have wronged us. So we'll say, you know, God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. <laughs> you know, and we call that out every time somebody says something mean or evil to us, because that's what we want the Lord to do. But he is more than that. In fact, you know, Brother George Ludd, one of our deacons, well, ex-deacons here, used to say, you can't put God in a box. And by me trying to put him in a box, that's still putting him in a box. But the Lord is more than capable of taking care of himself, taking care of us, and taking care of his creation. But as a believer, we still have a duty to evangelism. Sometimes you got to preach the word. And sometimes you preach the word by not saying a word. You preach the word by your life example. But again, it starts with faith. I'm going to do this now. I was going to do it later, but I want to do it now because I want us to start getting into our mind of what we see when we consider faith. This activity is going to require you to close your eyes, but I don't want you falling asleep. Okay? Not more than two minutes because otherwise y'all... But anyway, let's all just close our eyes. And my question is, do you see a vision for our responsibility within this community? Do you see a vision for the restoration of the homeless? Do you see a vision that shows that this body of believers will be an encouraging body of believers one to another? Do you see a vision by faith that the youth of this community will begin to effectively learn about Christ and commit to a life with him? Do you see by faith the victory of families and marriages? Can you see addiction recovery? Can you see love for premarital pregnancies, or better yet, premarital teen pregnancy, will they be received in love 
or will they be shunned? We have to see the faith by faith of the love. And by faith, can you see victory over the horrific events caused by postpartum depression and other mental health issues? Can you see the ability to guide somebody through the process of committing suicide and showing them love that will prevent it? You may open your eyes. Those of you who are still awake, all of this is what God is more than capable of doing. And he's doing it through his church. And we have a responsibility to do his will. We cannot be a spiritual hospital until we become a friendly church. The Bible says that the people will know that we belong to him by our love one to another. Without that, we are just a social club that gets together on Sundays at 7.30 and 10.30. We need to be more. We need to be brothers and sisters who are lodged in with each other, who are, who are bound arm in arm, marching to a victory in Christ Jesus. We all need to be effective in doing what we are capable of doing. Wherever, it's, if, it's, if it's on the campus and you got time, then let's spend a little time on the campus. You don't know by you being here, you might run into somebody that needed a word from God and you were carrying that word. The same happens in your own neighborhoods. It happens in the supermarkets. People need a word from God because this world is hurting. And it is damned to hell unless the church do something. We have to allow Christ to draw all men unto him. But our commission, just like officers in the military, they sign a commission. <coughs> our commission is to go and make disciples. That's what the Lord has told us to do. And we have to be strong enough to keep each other strengthened. So don't get caught up with faith in ourselves and other human beings over your faith in Christ. You've heard the, that comment about turning, what is it, mountains to molehills or molehills to mountains? Either one. But the thing is, I'm saying is we need to turn the mountain into a molehill and kick that molehill down the street somewhere. That molehill or mountain could be relationships that we have with our children, with our parents. Not all parents are good parents, unfortunately. But I tell you, we need better relationships in families. Relationships in our marriages, relationships with the Lord, the fact that we have have gotten so busy that our busyness has, has interfered with our prayer and devotional time. We need to get along with each other. Brothers and sisters, we need to speak to each other. I share this with you. If every Sunday you come to church and you only speak to the same few people, then you hop in your car and you roll to the house, you might stop off at, I don't know, Popeye's and get some chicken or something. And then you go home and make you some vegetables and get you some Hawaiian king rolls from the food distribution. And, and then you go and turn on some sport channel or something, that's for the men. Ladies might watch some HGTV where they're cooking and building houses and stuff like that. But if that's what you do, then there's a problem. Because you haven't shared yourself with somebody new. So how do they know, how do they know that the, the other cool brother in the church is Tony over there? Not just me, <laughs> you know? How do you not know these things if you don't talk to each other? You gotta, you gotta, you know, you gotta be able to you know, speak with Daryl and say, hey, I know who Daryl is. You know, he's my brother and I love him and if he comes in my mind, I'm gonna pray for him. 
or, or, or Tim or, or any of you guys. We need to know more about each other, which means we've got to be friendlier. So today, prayerfully, speak to somebody else other than who you normally speak to. Amen? All right, that just came off the cuff, but that's what it is. That's a mountain that we have as a body of believers. We have to consider, you know, Christ worthy of our trust. He's the one who died for us. You know, even the fact that we're trying to start new ministries here, we have great people with great ideas, but yet seemingly there's no help. Everybody else got something to do. Nobody's got time for this or time for that. And I guess Pastor called his meddling, but you know, that's what Pastor Gary do. He meddles. But you got people thinking about ministries, but they know that they're not getting any help. So, you know, we have to, we have to be willing to help folks especially if it's a ministry that you agree with. What I say by it, agree with, meaning that you have a call or a passion for. If you got a passion for youth, we need help in children's church, and we need help in the cool world. Because once it gets started, it is going to blow up. Why? Because I got faith to believe that not only can God do it, but he will do it. And I share that from here, because I believe what God is doing in this church. You gotta ask yourself, these mountains, are things done to glorify God? Are things done in Jesus' name to glorify ourselves? We as a, as a species are very narcissistic, meaning we want praise. We want praise for almost everything we do. Nobody wants to be on the down low and, and just do it because they can. They do it because they want somebody to make a big saying about what they're doing or what they've done. And I'm gonna say that's not Christ-like. If you don't like that, I am not apologizing. It just ain't. Okay, back to the scripture. We've got these nine disciples who were down from the mountain, did not go up to see Christ transfigured, speaking to Moses and Elijah. And when the, the disciples also had the ability to go to Christ in private, some things are done in public. Other things are done, critical growth is done in private. So Christ told the entire uh, crowd or the group, they were unbelieving and perverse. After that, and the disciples were there, so they heard that. So then now they come in and say, you know, Jesus, you know, why couldn't we do it? And then Jesus responds that, hey, because you have so little faith. He didn't say they did not have faith. He said they had so little faith. Then he goes to, uh, uh, compare it to the faith that's necessary in a mustard seed and how small that is. So the faith that they had was less than a mustard seed's faith. So they couldn't do anything. They failed because of their unbelief. Even though the disciples had faith, it was weak and ineffectual. Now you got to consider your own faith. Where does it lie? Remember, God can. We know that. We can, we can just shut the door on that. But what about God will? Do we have faith to believe God will? I got faith to believe that God will do a lot more than he's doing here now. And we need to, we need to prep ourselves to be friendly and encouraging to watch him work. Pastor said a few Sundays ago, we're going to see some folks over here with, with, with bag, sagging britches <laughs> on the campus. And how are we going to handle that? We're going to walk up, tell them, pull them britches up. Well, they don't know. Some of them probably they had no father. They don't know how to, how to dress well or to, to put on or even... Uh, 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 what's that, tie a tie. Men don't even know how to do that. 
So some of the men in the church would be the ones who would teach them how to do some of those things, how to dress themselves and prepare themselves for an interview, take them through mock interviews and show them how, how to, to, to say the words, research companies, so you know the words that they're looking to hear. The fact that you get the interview, period, they know you can do the job. Otherwise, you would never receive an interview request. But because you receive an interview request, now it's time to share how you fit in their organization. They need to learn those things. You gotta have faith to believe. And we increase our faith by continuing to believe in the awesomeness, the might, and the power of the Lord. Faith in general is a firm confidence in divine revelation. I know the scripture talks about not seeing and believing and all that stuff, but I'm saying, in general, it is firm confidence in the divine revelation. It's Godfidence. I believe God can and will. I have faith in that. So whatever your struggle is, whatever you're going through, rest assured that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is not only up there interceding on the right-hand side of the Father, but that he has a direct connection for us. Everything God does is what? Good. He don't do nothing muckety-muck. It's all good. And the Bible even tells us that he works all things together for good. For who? To those who love him. So if you're loving on the Lord and you know where your soul is going, you got joy. You may not be happy, but you got joy because Christ has, has made sure of that. But anyway, let's get back. So these disciples, they distrusted the power that they had received and as such failed to cast out the demon. So you gotta ask yourself, do you trust the spirit of God in you to do a task he has called upon you to do in your life? I know before I accepted a call to the ministry I think I must have ran for about 10 years. Because I think I, I received the call at an early age. When I say early, I mean in the preteen years. But everywhere I went and everything I tried to do, I tried to be the most, like Paul, sinner, sinner, sinner. I tried to be the most hellish little boy I could be. And everywhere I would go, somebody would say, oh, there's that little preacher over there. There's that preacher. So I left. I grew up in South Central Los Angeles. I left. And I went all the way up to the university at that time that I was attending. And you know, we had to get little jobs to make ends meet. So I got a little job in the food cafeteria where there's a lot of you know, older um, sisters working there. And she would come up and she would say, hey, little preacher, what you got going on today? Or they would have a little extra piece of cake or something that they would leave for the little preacher. And then everywhere I would go, you would just continue to find out that those things were happening. So eventually, by faith, you accept the call. And in so doing, there's a revelation that occurs the fact that is, the fact happens that your life is no longer your own. Your life is now, as all of us really are, in an aquarium where people are watching all that you do. Anywhere you go, cruises I go on, people sit down, well, you seem like a, a, a decent guy. I just want to ask you this question. And it's always religious in the questions that they ask. So I'll sit out and we'll have a nice spiritual conversation. They have no idea that I am a Southern Baptist preacher. They have no idea that I attend church services regularly. 
All they know is that I'm on this cruise ship with them and they got a question. And I try to do the best that I can to biblically answer. And that's the part that we need to be a part of as a body of believers. The revelation that needs to occur in us is one where we stop doubting the validity of our commission or fearing that the power has expired, that it's over. God don't work that way. All right, I digress. Satan does have an extraordinary power because everything is after our soul. And the extraordinary power of Satan must not discourage our faith. What is Satan going to do? He's going to do everything he possibly can to put a block in your walk. He's going to find ways of tempting you that you had no idea existed. And he will find a way where you would succumb to that temptation. You have to stay on guard. The power of Satan could even be in one of your bestest friends. If Satan can use Peter against Christ, he can use anybody against you. So we have to be mindful of that. Satan does have an extraordinary power that we give in to him. But rest assured, he cannot sustain himself against the rebukes of Christ. Good and evil cannot, cannot stay in the same vessel together. It just doesn't work. <coughs> Good is going to push evil out. Sometimes, though, even though the faith of these disciples was little, sometimes fasting needs to be a part of it. Pastor, I think maybe about three or four months ago, did a series on fasting. I think he had about five or six sermons about fasting 101, 102, like you were going to school. It was really good. Matter of fact, I kept them in my, uh, my notes in the Bible. But he was really good uh, explaining it. But fasting and prayer are proper means for bringing down any power Satan has against us. It's also a means for us to gather divine power in our assistance. Fasting is denying your body of something that it would like or want. And during that time, you would use it in your prayers to stay focused. So you disregard a need for your body in terms of praying and focusing on the Lord and what it is that it happens. It's an, it's an evidence, an instance of what we call humiliation and is necessary in prayer. It's also a kind of means of shaming some corrupt habits we have. And I know I'm gonna be the only one who admits to having a corrupt habit, shame on you. But we have these habits and disposing of them can kind of help us to, to, to serve our soul when we're praying. It's almost like it gives your prayer an extra boost, you know, that fasting makes you stay more focused on what the Lord is doing in your life. But I'm going to finish here real quick. So again, it starts with faith. Everything we do starts with having the faith to believe that God can and then the faith to believe that he will. Christ has made access to himself easy for everyone. And I mean everyone, sinner and saint. All of us can easily get to Christ. All we gotta do is say, dear Lord, or heavenly father, or something that acknowledges who he is. And we have access. Our cases of affliction that we have need to be made known to God with earnesty and fervent prayer. I'm sure you've heard of pray until something happens. That's the kind of praying we need going on in our church. 
in our homes, on our jobs. I mean, I went so far on my job, I was having so many problems, I took some oil. They had my oil anointed. I know this is an apostolic kind of thing, perhaps. And I went to the boardroom, and I anointed every seat and every doorway of that boardroom. I went to the general manager's office and anointed the, the doorways there. Inside my office, inside my department, anointing, door, anointing doorways and praying. Now, I lasted for a while. But when it was time for me to go, I can honestly say the Lord took me from where I was and set me somewhere so much better, with so much more joy. I went from being a crazed executive at a wastewater plant to a junior college teaching wastewater and water principles. So to me, this is, this is the much better for me. And I, and I thank God for it. Anytime I can explain how I achieved it, I say, through the grace of God. It wasn't me. Because if it was me, I would have messed it up. But we need to pray until something happens. The Lord expects us to be humble and fully depend on him and not ourselves. In fact, what does he say? In all things, acknowledge him and he will direct our path or make our path straight, whatever version you want to use. But he does expect humility. Now, there are times when we don't do what the Lord wants us to do, and as such, he becomes somewhat, the word I'm going to use is prohibitive, in, in using us. Meaning, he gets mad at us because of our unbelief in what he's trying to do. If unbelief reigns in our hearts, then we become faithless and perverse, deviating from righteousness. This provokes Christ. But in spite of all of that, this faithless and perverse generation, the disciples being anointed to cast out demons and not having the ability to do so, what did Christ do with the child? He cast the demon out of the child. He still showed compassion. He still showed mercy. He still showed tenderness. And that's what Christ does for all of us. Even though we get him upset, he still looks upon us with mercy and grace. All right, I know y'all ready to go. I would say I'm sorry, but I ain't. He has in himself a compassion for those who love him. He has true compassion for the world, but there's something different about those who love him and have a relationship with him. Christ is still our redeemer. And he continues to break the power of Satan upon his children. Satan cannot stand again before the rebukes of Christ. Christ answers our prayers and continues to intercede for us. But it all starts with faith. Faith that God can and faith that God will. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we thank you for being God. We thank you, Father, for looking upon us with favor and watching over us, protecting us even from ourselves. We thank you, Lord, for making sure that we are indeed your children and show you love. So, Father, there are some things that are happening in each of our lives. Some, some people may want to share. Some people may want, want to come up to the altar and pray. Some may want to be prayed with. But there are things happening in our lives. And people know that they need faith that you can and will do something. 
Help some way, somehow. Because we need you. And we pray, Father, for your will to be done. And let us be mindful of that. So introduce yourself to us, Lord. And let us see how you work. This body of, of believers here at Meridian. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. I just wanted to, wanted to get a microphone here so that you could hear um, Sister Alice White Cloud. She wants uh, to share. The Spirit has, has led her to share with you today, or share with us today, uh, a testimony. I know somebody, somebody this morning needs to be encouraged. Amen. I, and you can, have, you, can have, you can put on your vinegar face if you want to, but I know somebody in this room needs to be encouraged. And what she's going to share is going to encourage you. So just might as well turn your crown into a smile. Because some of you are looking at, oh, look. I know it's 1158 right, there, right behind me. I can see it. I'm sure that my watch is going to tell me. I don't even have my phone on me. My phone will go off at 12. But there's no trap doors. Nothing's going to happen. So, Sister Alice? and sisters because at one time I couldn't stand white people and then anybody sometimes yeah, not even some. myself <laughs> <laughs> one day God sent a white man to pick up my children for a vacation Bible school and I didn't understand that but I said how long are you going to take them see I used to protect my children but at that time I was gone I was lost and I, he said, well, four or five hours. And I go, okay. I can go to the bar without having to pay for a babysitter. That's four hours. Okay, go ahead and take them. And I went to the bar. And I tried to get back in time to be there for my children. Maybe, uh, you see, I, I go on Indian time, so I was a little late. But the same thing happened next day. And on Wednesday, I have a son, my oldest, named Strong Eagle. He came home and he said, Mom, Jesus loves you. I said, no, Jesus is for the white man. We worship Grandfather, the Creator. I will teach you the Indian way tomorrow. So we get up early, and I start dancing a tree that was in front of our little uh, studio where we were staying. And, of course, nothing happened. But they kept going all week. And I asked the man, come back Friday, tonight, I mean. And he came, but my friends were there. And, I, and they said, oh, what you bring us here? I said, no, this man is holy. So I asked him to leave. But next day in the morning, I found a book in in my place called Women of the Bible. And I opened it to Mary Magdalene. And she had washed Jesus' feet with her tears and poured perfume on his feet. I said, who are you? There is no good men. Said, my father, to other men, there is no good men. So who are you? I went outside and I said, Grandfather, are you Jesus? I said, Jesus, do you love Indians? And I said, if you do, I don't need this. I took Jack, you know Jack Daniel, and I flushed him down the toilet. The minute I flushed him down the toilet and put the bottle in the counter, 
I didn't understand what it was at the time, but I felt beautiful. I felt wonderful. The presence of the Lord had come. His Holy Spirit had touched me. I was so happy. I was so happy. I started to know who he was. The first thing I did, I went downstairs, ran to my friend's place, Joseph. I said, Joseph, I found the answer. I found Jesus. And he goes, yeah, I know him. You knew him and never told me. He said, I backslid. I didn't know what that meant. I, all I know is I'm never going to do that, I said. Brothers and sisters, on July 28th, 1985, I haven't had a drink. The Lord has healed me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All right, now it's time for us to worship through giving. Amen. All right. <laughs> Bless the Lord. Um, I should have a text for the offering, and I don't have my little sheet there. I apologize. Okay. 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 But our offering text is out of Genesis 8.20, and it reads, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. And taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. That's Genesis 8 and 20. Now, you know we are just stewards of what the Lord has given us. I don't care how much you got. You can have a million-dollar portfolio or, like I said, $2 in your pocket. It depends. As, as you make need and you come up with the idea of what you're giving to the Lord, but give without regret without compulsion, and say, this is for the Father. Amen? Amen? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of offering we have, and just continue to ask your favor of blessings on us as a family. We ask you to help us to be a friendlier church and to show our love. Help us all, Father, to say hello to somebody that we don't normally speak to uh, before we leave today, but also, Father, bless those with a gift and those without. Since we ask in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to ask Sister Carrie and Brother Jay to take care of our offering, please. Thank you. Brother Jay? Well, good afternoon. It is officially afternoon, so good afternoon. Um, it's, a, it's, below, it's six minutes after 12. Um, you see the, the announcements that have been kind of running back and forth. Uh, around behind me. But today, um, I want to, uh, well, we have a special privilege today. Amen. Amen. We are, uh, in case you don't know, uh, Pastor Gary hinted at it, there are things that are happening around here. And um, I'm just going to cut to the chase because some of you are, are, are anxious to get home and do whatever you need to do. And I'm sure it's very important. I'm not trying to make light of that. But um, one of the things that we're doing here at the church is we are developing a teen center. And we have uh, folks that are going through training to be equipped to do that. There's, there, are, uh, there aren't a lot of teens in this room right now, but there are some teens in this community. There are some teens that are associated with this church. There are some of you who know some teens and they may be your they may be your teens or they may be your grand teens and uh, you need to you you have a desire for them to know the Lord and uh, today I'm going to call a couple up uh, Tony and Delilah Duquette and um, we are today going to commission them as our youth workers Amen. 
for Tony and Delilah. I know Pastor Gary already said that he was, Tony's one of the cooler guys in the church. Um, but Delilah's much cooler than Tony is. Amen? All right. Um, well, you know, Scripture tells us that, that the gifts that Christ gave were that some would be apostles, some would be prophets, some would be evangelists, some would be pastors, some would be teachers, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry of building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. That's in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Today, what I'm asking us to do is gather and to acknowledge, or as we're gathered here, to acknowledge, to thank, and to commission Tony and Delilah, who have been called to guide, to teach, and to nurture the youth of this congregation and community. God has called them to serve as youth workers, leaders, teachers, to walk, to walk alongside of the youth of this congregation and this community, offering them their energy, their intelligence, their imagination, and most of all, their love. And as they accept this role as youth leaders within this congregation, my prayer is that they will know and feel the prayers, the support, and love that embraces them that comes from this congregation. May it empower them and to continue to engage our youth with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love. And may you know that God's love and approval is upon you as you grow in your faith, hope, and love each and every day. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this couple. We thank you for their experiences through life that have led them to this moment. Lord, we pray your blessings upon them. We pray that you would renew in them the energy that they need to, to be the teachers, the pastors, the evangelists that you've called them to be, not only with the congregation, with the youth of this congregation, but the youth in this community. We pray, God, that you would, again, crown their heads with intelligence and imagination that goes beyond their own experience, that leads directly and comes directly from you. We ask God that as we support them with our prayers and with our love, that you, Father, will answer our prayers and that you'll love them, put a hedge of protection around them and keep them from any hurt, harm, and danger. And Lord, we pray for their family as well, that you would, Lord, again, equip their entire family to walk in this ministry. We thank you for them. We thank you for the dedication in their lives. And we ask all of this in the precious and mighty name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord, with joy, thanksgiving, and forgiveness of sin. Amen. 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 Shall we stand?
Lord, what a wonderful day this has been. How you have blessed us indeed. We ask, Lord, that you would continually bless us and that you would keep us. That you would make your face shine upon us. That you would be gracious unto us. That you would lift up your hands or lift up your countenance upon us. And that you would give us, Lord, peace. We thank you as well for all of the visitors. We thank you for our family members who've come from far away to be with us today. I pray, God, that you would continually bless and keep us. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said,